as we always do in Australia, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. I am on the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. They are the traditional owners of the land. They've been here for maybe 80,000 years for a very, very long time. The territory has never been ceded. There's no treaty between the white people here and the citizens uh, and indigenous people. And part of our mission has got to be to make sure that there is justice for indigenous people as well as for us and for all people, because unless we all come from a just place and live in a just place, we cannot feel safe in the world. So that's my little bit of preaching. Now, tonight is uh, an event that grew out of a thought about what do we do in Australia to talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is someone who's been an inspiration uh, to me and to many others, but how important was she in Australia? How many Australian women knew about her? Could we run a standalone event? Did we need to run an event about reproductive rights? Should we run an event about the Supreme Court and what's going to happen to Roe versus Wade? These are all really important questions. And we consider that tonight is the beginning of the conversation that we're going to have around Ruth Bader Ginsburg's influence, because these are questions that we want to address. One of the pillars that we've adopted by our advocacy committee at National Council of Jewish Women Australia is an advocacy a pillar around reproductive rights. So in the next 12 months, you'll certainly be hearing more from us about that. And of course, you can't talk about reproductive rights unless you talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her influence in this area. But tonight we want to talk about the whole idea that Ruth Bader Ginsburg represents in some ways, which is the idea of Jewish women dissenting and the idea of Hanukkah being a festival that we can talk about Jewish women and the role women, Jewish women can play in making the world a better place. And so we're going to travel through a whole lot of different ideas about Jewish women. And at the end of this evening, we're going to light the candles. Tonight is the seventh night of Hanukkah. So it's been very exciting in the lead up. I've been away, so I've been uh, having to work out what you do when you're in a motel room to light candles when there's smoke alarms and other such things. And uh, people are all around uh, the country and the world, so we're at different time zones. But we will be at the right time to be lighting candles in Melbourne, Australia at the time we light. Now, the reason that we had decided that the seventh night of Hanukkah was an appropriate night to have this discussion was that there is a tradition, a Mizrahi tradition, a tradition of the Jews from North Africa, from Yemen, from Iran, from Iraq, and we'll he hear two seconds more about this in a minute, for a festival called Chag Habanot, which I've only just discovered. And this festival is a festival where we celebrate women and women's relationship with social action and doing things. And I'm just going to ask Peter Pelach, who's one of our international national guests tonight, and I'll introduce her properly before she gives her more formal uh, speech. But Peter, would you like to just come on and say, say something for a minute about Chag Habanot? Yes, um, apparently it's a North African tradition. I say apparently because like you, uh, Lindy, I wasn't uh, fully aware of it, even though I am married into the family. So it's my hug, it's my celebration. Every Hanukkah includes a Rosh Chodesh, a first of the month, it's today. And Rosh Chodesh is a woman's festival. And in Tunisia, the Rosh Chodesh of Hanukkah, the new month of Hanukkah was dedicated to women. And like so many other North African customs, when the North African community came here to Israel, they, they dissipated, the customs dissipated. But a friend of mine, who's a journalist, Peggy Sidor, who is of Tunisian background, has made a huge effort to revive this festival. And now older people are remembering when they used to do it in Tunisia, and it's catching on here too. It's going to take a while, but I think in three or four years, we'll all know about it. So what's fantastic is that here in Australia, we can say that we're trailblazers bringing this festival back to its roots, that is to the roots of Jewish women. So we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start with Hanukkah's women. We're going to start with Jewish women making things happen, biblical women and later. And we're really fortunate that the person who's going to speak about this is Yael Unterman. Now Yael is one of the most amazing teachers and uh, interpreters of Bible. She 
I don't know whether she invented bibliodrama, but she almost invented bibliodrama. If she didn't invent it, she's certainly the person who taught me anything about it. And, and she's an author. In one of her books is actually Nechama Leibovitz, uh, Teachers and the Bible Scholar, The Hidden Things, 12 Stories of Love and Longing. But that's what Peter's going to talk about. Uh, Yael instead is going to talk about uh, Jewish women. And she also, by the way, runs Zoom workshops, including one on bibliodrama in Australia. So uh, uh, later on, we'll send you some information because you might want to join one of her workshops at some stage. But over to you, Yael. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated that you're going to share some knowledge with us for the first candle. Thank you very much. Uh, hello from Jerusalem, everyone. It's uh, really my pleasure and honor to be the first speaker in this event this evening, the seventh night of Hanukkah for you. I'm still in the sixth night. Um, seven's an important number in Judaism. Uh, we have the Shabbat on the seventh day and we have the Shemitah year as the seventh year. And both the Shabbat and the Shemitah are aimed at enhancing society's functioning by pausing and resting and reflecting so that one can return refreshed and perhaps enlightened by new thoughts to the usual busy activity of the week of making the world a good place for God's creatures. So uh, if you like, you can view this event that we're having now on the seventh night of Hanukkah as a pause from actual activity in order to reflect and learn and then return to that activity enriched. So I want to talk tonight about Jewish women making things happen. Now, the main narrative of Hanukkah is that of Jewish men making things happen, which is the Maccabees. I'm assuming there were also some women in the picture, but they do seem to be uh, behind the scenes. However, we have in our tradition one story of a Jewish woman named Judith, who by dint of her courage and resourcefulness managed to save her city. And by the way, the name Judith in Hebrew, Yehudit, actually literally means Jewish in the feminine. So we can see her as a stand-in for all Jews and perhaps particularly Jews of the feminine persuasion. Now, the book of Judith is not included in the Jewish biblical canon, what we term the Tanakh. Uh, it was also not mentioned in early rabbinic literature. However, it saw a resurgence of popularity in the Middle Ages and it became associated with the festival of Hanukkah due to its tale of a heroine conquering a Syrian Greek general. It tells of Judith, a beautiful widow and possibly the daughter of a high priest who stood up to speak her truth for the sake of her faith and her people. The Greek general named Holofernes besieged the Judean town of Betulia until the townsfolk were starving and in utter desperation. They gathered in the marketplace and decided they would give God five more days before they surrendered. Judith then spoke up and said, why five days? If you have faith in God, you should never give up. The elders were impressed by her steadfastness and asked her to pray. But for Judith, faith did not contradict action. On the contrary, they went together. She had a plan and she carried it out. She left the city with her maid in veiled, veiled but in beautiful clothes and a basket filled with cheese rolls and strong wine. She entered the enemy's camp and demanded to see Holofernes, the general, saying she had an important message. Holofernes was delighted by his attractive visitor. Judith informed him that when the townspeople would run out of kosher food, which was imminent, then they would start to eat non-kosher and then God's wrath would fall upon them and then he could succeed in conquering them. She said that she would be his informant as to whether that event would actually happen. Entirely captivated by her, he prepared a tent for her and her maid and gave orders they not be harmed as they walked to and from the city. On the third day, she told him there was no kosher food left. Delighted, he ordered a celebratory feast to take place and he planned to have sexual relations with her after it. However, she fed him a lot of salty cheese, which made him very thirsty. And then he drank all of the strong wine that she had brought and fell down in a drunken stupor. At which point she seized his heavy sword, raised it and chopped off his head. After taking a moment to compose herself, I like that phrase, it took her a moment to compose herself, she wrapped his head up, 
hid it under her shawl and walked back to her town and presented the head to the Jewish general, Uziah. After this, the enemy fled in confusion with their general beheaded. They didn't know what to do. And Judith had saved the town of Betulia and all of its inhabitants. So this is the tale. Whether historical or fantastical, it informed Jewish tradition enough that there is actually a custom to eat cheese on Hanukkah in memory of Judith's cheese and the miracle of salvation wrought through it. So tonight or tomorrow, you can have a nice piece of cheddar or mozzarella and connect to the qualities of faith, bravery, determination, and clarity of thought exhibited by Judith in saving her people. To our modern sensibilities, the violence in the story is difficult. We might prefer that there would have been a more peaceful resolution, but those were very violent circumstances and Judith was working with what she had. Violent or not, we see her qualities and we admire and learn from them. Now, Judith was heiress to a long line of biblical heroines who exhibited great resourcefulness and cunning in making sure that the right thing would be done. She herself, as she raises that sword above the drunken general's head, is recorded as saying, answer me, O Lord, as you answered Yael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite, when you delivered the wicked general Sisera into her hands. Strengthen me this once that I may bring your deliverance to my people whom this cruel man vowed to destroy and let the nations know you have not forsaken us. In this quote, the text guides us to make the association, which we might have made anyway, with the biblical figure of Yael, after whom I'm named. Apparently, my parents thought that a woman who killed someone with a tent peg would make a good role model for their daughter. It explains a lot. Now, Yael, who probably is not Jewish, but according to one tradition, converted later, single-handedly won the war when she provided refuge for a fleeing Canaanite general named Sisera. She gave him milk to drink. By the way, you never realized milk was so dangerous, did you? Okay. And when he fell asleep, she killed him with a tent peg, which is what she had to hand, thus winning the war that the prophetess Deborah and her general Barak waged at the time with the local Canaanites. Um, the link with this story is strengthened in the book of Judith when the text describes Judith as saying, oh daughter, you are blessed by the most high God above all other women on earth. Yael is similarly praised in the song of Deborah as blessed above women is Yael, wife of Heba the Canaanite, blessed above all women in the tent. And Deborah herself, by the way, is another Jewish woman who's in a leadership role a judge and involved in military affairs. There are a number of other women in the Bible who demonstrate a proactive nature. To anyone who thinks that religious tradition mandates that women be meek and passive, I would say, have you ever opened the Bible? In some ways, the women of the Bible are more proactive than the men, often because God almost always speaks to the men. So they're often doing what they commanded to do while the women find themselves on their own in situations that need rectifying, and they themselves step up to the plate. For example, Sarah, who's seeing that she's not having a child, tells Abraham to take Hagar to wife. Doesn't end so well, but it was a, it was a, it was a plan. Rebecca, who makes a plan to disguise her son Jacob as Esau so that he will receive the firstborn blessings because she believes that they should go to him. Uh, later on, Abigail, who persuades King David not to take revenge on her husband, Nabal, okay? He's so impressed that he later marries her. Now, particularly amazing is it to follow the line that leads to the birth of King David and hence the messianic line, because the Messiah is, the, is the, traditionally the descendant of David. This entire line is filled with biblical women doing exceptional and even bizarre things to ensure that they can keep the generations going and do the right thing. The first women that who, who we can term these mothers of Messiah are Lot's daughters. Having fled from the destruction of their home in Sodom with their father, they come to a cave in the mountains. Now they erroneously believe that the whole world has been destroyed and they're the only inhabitants left. So they get their father drunk and they sleep with him in order to have children and keep humanity going. 
the result of this is two nation is two children who become nations Ammon and Moab Moab ends up being the ancestor of another mother of Messiah who is the famous Ruth when Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi tries to go back to her Israelite people after the death of all the men in the family Ruth asserts her will by clinging to Naomi and insisting on going with her and joining her people. Returning to Bethlehem, Naomi then gives Ruth's instructions to go sleep on the threshing floor where Boaz, who is the family's official redeemer, is. This leads to their marriage and together they have a baby, Oved, who is the grandfather of King David, okay? So we've seen Lot's daughters and we've seen Ruth. And one more woman in the Messianic line, very interesting, is Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah. She's married to first one and then a second of Judah's sons and both die. By the laws of levirate marriage, she's supposed to be given to, because she's childless, to the third son, Shelah. But Judah is a bit reluctant to give her to his third son after his first two sons die. So he leaves her to sit and wait for years with nothing happening and her prime years going by. So one day she veils herself, dresses up as a prostitute and goes and sits at a junction named Petach Enaim, which means the opening of the eyes. Judah's eyes are not open to her identity. He thinks of her as a prostitute and so he has uh, sex with her and then she goes home and in time it transpires that she is pregnant. Well, Judah wants to burn her for her promiscuity, but she produces his staff, seal and cord, which in today's equivalent would be passport, ID, driving license. And she says, uh, Judah given these to her as a security after he'd been with her and she declares that these belong to the father of the children. Well, Judah admits to the righteousness of her actions and she gives birth to twins, Zerach and Peretz. And Peretz is the ancestor of Boaz, who, as we mentioned, is the great grandfather of King David. So we've seen that in Jewish tradition, the messianic line is informed by women stepping out of their comfort zone and using all of their attributes to change situations and bring redemption to them. Other such women include Miriam, the prophetess whose resourcefulness at the tender age of five saved the life of her brother Moses, and he ended up being the most important leader of Israel and eventually the, giving of the, uh, the giver of the Torah. Also the five daughters of Tzalafchad, who with precise timing and an attitude of faith and justice, actually approach Moses, the leader of all the Israelites, to point out something unfair and problematic in God's law when it comes to their inheritance. Pointing out a flaw in God's law, no less. Moses doesn't know what to do and asks God, who replies, justly do the daughters of Tzalafchad speak, and the law changes. Their pure intention and clarity of thought make it happen. And for the sake of contrast, when a man named Korach tries to argue with the political setup and change things, his intention is not pure, and he ends up being swallowed alive into the earth. I'll end with a few more great examples. We have, still in the Bible, Queen Esther, a beautiful example of someone who transitions from passivity, from being shaped by events and by Mordechai's instructions, to activity. Galvanized by Mordechai to action, she immediately starts coming up with her own plans and ideas, and victory and deliverance follow for the entire Jewish people plus a new holiday of Purim in the Jewish calendar involving the consumption of millions of calories to challenge those on the diet. It's hard to be a Jew. Now in the Talmud, we have the example of Rabbi Akiva's wife, Rachel. She took a humble shepherd and approached him. She was a rich man's daughter, he was a humble shepherd. And in a very original chat up line, she boldly asked him, if we become engaged, will you go study in the yeshiva, in the academy? Uh, any single ladies on the call, you should try this chat up line. It, it worked for her, okay? And he does, and he becomes the magnetic leader of an entire generation and many thousands of students. Another Talmudic heroine is Bruria. She was very learned and she showed her husband how to pray for the repentance of the wicked rather than for their death. She had enormous inner strength and when her two sons suddenly died on Shabbat, she was able to hide the fact from her husband until Shabbat had gone out 
and she could find a way to tell him that might soften the blow. Finally, in modern times, we have Sarah Shanira, a Polish Jewish seamstress and educator, who, seeing that the young Jewish girls of her time were feeling distanced from the Judaism of their mothers and going astray because they weren't receiving any kind of proper Jewish education, she made the radical move for the time of founding a school for girls which eventually became the famous Base Yankov network of schools for girls. And we also have Nechama Leibowitz, a Torah teacher who changed the lives of many thousands of students about whom Peter will tell us soon. So in sum, we've seen a rich tradition of, uh, of women, of faith and action. And what I've given you here is only the tip of the iceberg. I believe that if we discuss their stories, go deep into them and learn from their dilemmas and challenges, it can serve to deepen and evolve our choices and actions for mature and effective world change and redemption so that we can all be part of the Geula. Thank you very much and happy Hanukkah. And Chodesh Tov. Well, well, yeah, well, thank you so very, very much. Everyone can give you a, a wave, a clap or a, a participation thing. Uh, you brought those stories to life so amazingly that I, I'm a bit worried because there's so much um, violence, passion, sex, education, um, and food that we have to think about when we talk about uh, women in our tradition and the passion with which all these women dissented from the idea that people had about what women should do. Because none of these women were doing what was expected of women. And that's a pretty amazing message. Uh, it is interesting, though, to think that when we think about Hanukkah and we think about Jewish women, we sort of think of it in some sort of religious context. So we think that a Jewish heroine is going to be somebody who is in some way connected with our biblical tradition. They're going to be somebody who perhaps is uh, associated with the, um, the messianic line or somebody who is very religious and has uh, introduced schools or somebody who has worked for the Jewish people in a particular way. Now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a very different sort of Jewish woman hero because she's not a biblical woman. She's a modern woman. And she's not a, a religious woman, at least in the sense that people very often think that we have to have our Jewish heroines being part of a very narrow conservative structure of Judaism. Of course, the women Yael spoke to about started off in one structure and didn't stay confined uh, to uh, people's ideas of them either. But let's hear what from Ant Antonia Levine. Antonia is joining us from Sa San Francisco tonight. Uh, it's actually early in the morning, her time. Antonia is an amazing woman. She's been, uh, she's the executive director of National Council of Jewish Women San Francisco. She's also a lawyer with over 20 years experience working in prosecution, litigation and oversight. She's been involved in criminal law in Europe specializing in justice reform in human rights protection, looking at domestic law and international law, the European Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, served for several years as the appointed expert of the European Union's group of experts in trafficking in human rights, human beings, sorry. And she works in so many different areas of social justice reform and advocacy. And of course, she's got her work cut out for her being in the United States of whatever uh, people would like to add to the end of the way people in Australia and other places around the world think about the difficulties that United States as uh, women and social justice advocates are, are confronting. Antonia, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to hearing how uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a Jewish hero for the second candle of Hanukkah tonight. Melinda, thank you so much for, um, your kind introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this wonderful event. Congratulations to the great Jewish women of Australia for putting together this event and inviting us from all over the world to speak tonight. I want to start, um, it's a very difficult uh, task to speak about Justice Ruth Ginsburg. Um, I, I feel flattered and honored to have the opportunity to do so. Uh, but first I 
we want to acknowledge a great Jewish woman of Australia who worked uh, in America in the San Francisco section of the National Council of Jewish Women and left a lasting memorable legacy in our section and many followers and admirers. And this is Yara Morris. She is now board member of uh, the Australian National, National Council of Jewish Women. And of course, her mother, Esther, uh, who we met and we admire deeply as well. Uh, you're so lucky to have them. Uh, and with this, I will start uh, my presentation about uh, Justice Ruth Ginsburg. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that she was not an observant, religiously observant Jew, but she had a deep, she was deeply conscious of her Jewish roots, her Jewish identity. And um, I want to read uh, to all of you um, an address, just an excerpt from an address that uh, she had uh, at the American Jewish Committee after she was appointed um, to the Supreme Court. I am a judge born, raised, and proud of being a Jew. The demand for justice runs through the entirety of the Jewish tradition. I hope in my years on the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States, I will have the strength and the courage to remain constant in the service of that demand. She explicitly underlined the fact that her Jewish roots in the first place uh, gave her this uh, demand for justice and in many ways uh, determined her career and her activism um, uh, throughout the years. Uh, but you mentioned also she was not a biblical woman, but she became such an icon for women around the world, not just women, uh, not just Jewish women. And uh, of course, when I uh, had the invitation to speak about her, um, I didn't want to give you the facts from her biography. I rather wanted to explore together with you what made her such woman and how was that associated with her Jewish roots. It's uh, notorious that um, it's very well known that she was born in Brooklyn in a family of father uh, immigrant from Russia and mother just first generation uh, American <clears throat> uh, with family, a Jewish family uh, with roots in Poland. And um, what Justice Ginsburg said about her parents and also very well known, uh, she said, Neither, neither of my parents had the means to attend college, but both taught me to love learning, to care about people, and to work hard for whatever I wanted or believed in. And she was also notorious with the way she was writing and every single word even in laconic phrases that she was using had a special meaning. And these three phrases, the three important things that her parents taught her explain 
why she was so successful and why she became such an icon. Uh, because um, she had a deep knowledge of the law and it resulted from the love to learning, which her parents uh, brought to her life and taught her of. Uh, she cared about people. She was always there for those in need, for those left behind or discriminated, not just women, uh, LGBT community, immigrants. And uh, the next, the third one, she was so resilient, so methodical, so uh, she worked with perseverance and extreme dedication uh, toward uh, the success of her course. And in our case, the main priority of her life, of her career, were women and fighting discrimination against women. So what else influenced uh, Justice Ginsburg? Of course, another great Jewish woman, her mother. She speaks very often about her mother uh, not only with love, but deep respect and uh, recognition for um, what her mother gave her as a woman, in addition to uh, the love to education and um, encouragement to care about people. She taught her to be independent to be a lady, uh, to uh, have a, a good profession, uh, profession that she enjoys to um, work in and uh, to make sure that she is economically independent because it was so important and her mother never could be because she worked at home. She didn't have a profession. Uh, to a great extent, her mother um, influenced the future of Justice Ginsburg. No question of that, acknowledging Jewish mothers. And then I believe looking throughout the career of Justice Ginsburg and her early life, uh, that the sacrifice that she was challenged to uh, submit uh, was so important in her life. Uh, her path to success, to an incredible success, wasn't easy. She was challenged in many ways. She was challenged because she, um, throughout all her life, had to carry about sick uh, very ill members of the family. She was caring about her mother uh, when she uh, became sick of cancer. And later after the um, um, crash of her husband and uh, with his uh, terminal illness, uh, also cancer, she had to carry about him. And of course, caring about the family and having all these challenges, she was able to make a career and became, become uh, such icon because uh, she still was caring about people and uh, focusing on women's rights and um, the rights of other disadvantaged groups. In addition to that, another extreme challenge was discrimination. She was challenged by discrimination from uh, her years uh, in college, um, in Cornell. Uh, she was challenged later when she uh, became a student uh, and her professor asked the only 
the nine women uh, in uh, her class uh, to reflect on why they deserve to be students uh, taking uh, room, taking uh, seats of men that could be students in uh, this uh, educational institution. Um, later, she uh, was not invited despite all her acknowledgements and recognitions as an excellent student. She wasn't invited to any of the law firms uh, in New York because uh, she was a woman and she was a Jewish woman, which she speaks about as one of the reasons not to be invited. But this of course didn't stop her. Uh, as a mother, as a pregnant woman, she had to hide that she is pregnant not to lose her job when later employed as a professor. And I believe that all these challenges, uh, especially the discrimination, framed her priorities and uh, made her to dedicate her career and life to fighting discrimination against women and many other forms of discrimination, but we all know her passion was women and women's rights. And when she first met, uh, started working um, as a professor, splitting her time between the work of professor and um, uh, her work on women's rights, she didn't choose the easy way to just go to one case or just give an opinion. She looked at the philosophy of the law. She looked at the roots of the problem with discrimination against women. And she employed all her knowledge to um, attack the um, foundation of um, discrimination. And uh, she looked at the big picture. She didn't uh, make it, making all these small steps towards success. She was looking at the global picture and she always knew what is the final goal. Um, in uh, her uh, work against discrimination. Most of her cases as um, an attorney before becoming a judge are uh, well known. Uh, it's important to uh, speak about her creativity and how smart she approached the problem. Uh, she uh, took uh, cases which uh, give her an opportunity to uh, attack discrimination, not only uh, against women, but also against men uh, based on uh, the fact that they are parents as well. One of her famous case uh, in this uh, um, creative way uh, persuaded uh, the all men uh, court uh, that she's right and the parent can be discriminated just based on gender. And this would not be um, a good approach and good reading of the law and the constitution, uh, regardless of the gender of um, the plaintiff. Uh, later uh, in the, I just want to be also mindful of the time. Later when uh, appointed uh, to the Supreme Court, she uh, was, 
her uh, nomination was attacked by women's group because of her opinion about the rationale of uh, the decision uh, of Roe v. v um, let me just find, want to quote her, but now I cannot. So in this uh, historic decision, she, uh, it's well known, she expressed an opinion uh, that uh, very uh, quick steps, very rapid st st steps in defending the right of women, the right of choice, uh, can be uh, detrimental to the movement because they would uh, uh, be because uh, if the society, if the community is not ready for such rapid change, it will create a very vigorous response uh, against uh, uh, the idea of women having the right of choice as their fundamental right. And the history proved her right because uh, this issue became a political issue and it was and still is used uh, for political reasons which damages, which hurts the cause of achieving uh, full um, freedom of women to choose what they can do with their bodies. Uh, but of course only visionary like her could see so many years back in time how um, the whole movement will develop and what will result from the decision of the Supreme Court. Of course, this didn't stop her uh, to continue to fight for women. Uh, her uh, big cause was to achieve the high, highest standard of review for uh, gender discrimination, uh, similarly to uh, the way race is treated uh, by the Constitution and the Supreme Court in the United States. Uh, as you all know, this fight continues. We unfortunately did not achieve this highest review uh, of gender discrimination by the Supreme Court, uh, but uh, she laid the foundation and uh, many lawyers inspired by her continue uh, to carry the torch. Thank you uh, so much, Antonia. I'm going to, I, 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 I'm just conscious of the time and you've got so much passion and so much excitement. We've learned so much about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She clearly uh, affected you. Now, one of the things I didn't say to anyone before was that you could put questions into the chat. We, we're going to, we've got a lot of people speaking. We've got a lot of candles to light tonight. And we're going to, and Antonia, I haven't finished saying thank you. So I'm coming back in a second. But I do want to say, if you've got a question for any of the speakers, please put it in the chat and we'll try at the end. After we've lit candles, hopefully pe people can stay around and chat with some of those questions rather than taking questions for now. Antonia, You've shown us so many important elements of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life, so many things that are important about someone taking a role in the public, being prepared to stand up and taking their Judaism as a base for what they do, even if they're not coming from a particularly religious perspective. But one thing that you said, which uh, just resonates for the way we are looking at our uh, women tonight is that the one of the most important pers persons, one of the most important people in anybody's life is their mother. And family is just so important. You know, our Jewish family is part of our family. Our biological family is part of our family. All of the other Jewish women are important to us. And we're going to move now to Allah, 
So uh, Antonio, can everybody please give Antonio a, a round of applause for the, that magnificent approach. I know I cut you off when you have more to say, but it's just getting very late for everybody. So I'm very sorry that I had to do that. But we're going to move to, to Ala Melman because Ala is uh, another very important person in the Australian Jewish community because she's a member of the board of National Council of Jewish Women Australia. She's a physiotherapist who's doing a doctorate on public health. And she's been involved in the Jewish community in a whole range of different ways. But tonight she's going to talk about this whole issue about family and about, she's going to talk about celebrating women whose survival itself is an act of defiance, simply by surviving. And she's going to talk about four generations of women in her family. So thank you, Antonia. Thank you. Uh, um, and now let's move to Allah and let's hear about another family and other mothers being influential. Thank you, Melinda. So uh, yes, I will be speaking about survival as an act of defiance. Raised on stories of our family's miraculous survival at the dinner table, the stories seemed as mythical to me as the fantasy books I loved with dragons and fairies. It is only now that I have my own children that I understand the true heroism of my ancestors. The tenacity, sheer stubbornness, and ingenuity it took to be here to celebrate Hanukkah with you all today. My great-grandmother Luba survived the 1918 Bolshevik Revolution, after which religion was banned and the local synagogue was converted into a gymnasium. She married my great-grandfather Moshe, who became the mayor of my birth town, Vitebsk. In 1937, he was arrested by Stalin Soviet police, accused of treason. His only crime was being Jewish. He was jailed for several years, surviving water torture in an attempt to extract a false confession. Luba kept her family alive by working, cleaning the local morgue, whilst living in friend, with friends in a basement. In 1941, the German troops invaded Belarus. By this stage, Luba was the director of the Huda Penn Museum and a mother of four. I think of what was important to her as she packed to escape on a coal train with her four children. When fleeing the Nazi invasion, she gathered 200 artworks of Yehuda Penn, a teacher of the renowned Marc Chagall, transporting them to safety. His paintings, capturing everyday Jewish life, can be found today on display in Belarusian museums. Luba put her younger son, still a baby, under a copper pot to protect him from rogue bullets as their open coal train passed through Leningrad. When I bemoaned the struggle of making dinner after a long day working in my doctorate from the safety of my own home, I think of my great-grandmother, evacuated with that one copper pot, scrounging around to find something to add to the watery broth while making sure her pot is not stolen if she looks away. It's a useful reality check on my enormous privilege, living in safety with endless opportunities. I am inspired when I think of my maternal grandmother, Sima, who completed her medical studies while taking refuge in Southern Russia. Once hastily graduated, she was sent to run a surgical unit on the German front line at the ripe age of 23. She celebrated the end of World War II in Berlin. Her grandparents, who stayed in their village, had refused to evacuate. The village was converted into a ghetto and they were murdered in 1942. When I think of survival against adversity, I think of my paternal grandmother, Haya, surviving constant hunger in childhood. Escaping Belarus on foot, creeping through the forest at night to avoid harassment by local villagers, eventually finding her way to Uzbekistan by train. She worked in appalling conditions in the fields there, eventually returning home to find the family home had been taken over by neighbours. 90% of the Belarusian Jewish population had not survived. Her sister, 12-year-old Rosa, was away at a summer camp when the Nazis crossed the border and was murdered. The survivor guilt must have been tremendous. I think of the decision my great-grandmother had to make to evacuate without her youngest daughter so that the family could survive. Now that my children are at the same age as Rosa, the thought of having to evacuate without them creates a knot in the stomach. I was so proud last week when my seven-year-old daughter asked if she could bring her Hanukkah dreidel and PJ library books to school to teach her class about Hanukkah. She felt safe to share and proud of her heritage. Our family story is one of survival and determination against all odds. My mother helped orchestrate the mass exodus of her extended family from Belarus to Australia in what must have been a bureaucratic version of Dante's Inferno. 
Despite our flights being double booked and hastily having to obtain new tickets, we made it. Had she not taken that chance and put up with the status quo, we would still be living under a communist dictatorship without freedom of expression or religion. Earlier this year, the rightful female prime minister of Belarus, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, was forced to go into hiding as the tyrannical Lukashenko threatened the lives of her and her children. To live in a democracy and freely advocate for social justice without threat to personal safety is not to be taken for granted. When my friends ask me why I take on advocacy and community work on top of working, studying and raising a family, it is because it's my greatest privilege. I do it because I can, because I follow a long line of women who survived. That was their act of defiance. So that we can be here and not only survive, but thrive. It is our responsibility to advocate for the rights of women and children to live in safety. To use the miracle that is being right here, right now, to elevate our communities and all that we can empower. Thank you, Ella, so much for sharing that with us. That was just, um, you've really touched all of our souls, I believe, tonight. And, you know, we hear about important people whose names are sung and whose uh, stories are told in the broad community. But we actually know that so many of, so many, much of the true heroism actually resides just around us in the people who are fighting to survive, and those of us who have any privilege, you know, you, you, know, you are quite an inspiration to us all to take the message so clearly from your parents and your grandparents, of course, and your great grandparents. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. What we're going to do now is just have a little bit of a break because you've listened to three speakers and we're going to go into breakout groups so all of you can take a minute to share with each other some thoughts about the women who've been influential to you who've made you realize that you can take action and you can do something to change the world. Think about whether that's your mother or a, a public figure, a biblical figure, who it could be. It could be anybody, but let's just clearly share the stories just as Allah has so wonderfully and so um, amazingly, you know, we are so honored Allah that you should share such personal things with us. So uh, Gabby is going to move us into breakout groups for a few minutes. You should have all received an invitation to join a room. If you're having any issues with it, just let me know. Um, but it, there should be a, a button to just join your room that you've been assigned to. Going to move now to Michaela Raphael. M Michaela is in Perth and I invited her to speak tonight because she's going to talk about the sort of thing that a young woman can do or any woman can do whether they're younger or older when they decide that there is an issue that needs to be discussed and I think that Michaela you can speak for yourself. Michaela is a young Jewish woman from Perth. At 18 she moved overseas living in Indonesia and Mexico and hitchhiking from China to Kyrgyzstan. Last year she returned to Australia to study psychology and earlier this year, she co-founded an organization called Young Women Against Sexual Violence. And she's going to talk about the experience of uh, supporting a group that focuses on supporting women with a lived experience of sexual violence and engaging in community discussions on consent. Michaela, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me um, on the, at this event. Um, yeah, so I... Um, was living overseas for quite a while and when I lived in Mexico um, I had a lot of friends who were feminists and it was the first time that I became very exposed um, to people who spoke up about issues which they felt passionate about um, and sexual violence is something that is really um, something that I care about a lot um, or making change towards 
um, how common it is. Um, because something that I experienced and a lot of people who I love have experienced it and um, just talking to friends, you realize that it's a lot more common um, than, than we would think or than what the statistics tell us. Um, and so about two years ago, I had an idea that I wanted to have an exhibition with um, young women's letters um, of women in the Jewish community in Perth, um, because it's a small community. And I thought it would be very powerful if people walk into a room um, knowing that these letters are our daughters and our sisters um, who have been through this. Um, and they could have been anonymous um, or not. But anyway, I had this idea. Um, and just to also engage people in a conversation and realize that often, you know, people look at other cultures or other countries and they'll say, we don't have any issues here, like we don't need feminism um, here. And I really, knowing how common um, sexual assault is, I wanted the community that I'm from to recognize this is an issue here in our community. And it is um, being perpetrated by our boys, by our sons, and it's happening to our daughters. So that was an idea I had about two years ago, um, but I was never able to do that because I only have a handful of um, friends and um, I was not going to just like, contact every Jewish woman that I knew and be like, hey, like, would you want to participate in this? So for about two years, I didn't do anything. Um, and then this year in August, I decided to start a platform online called My Body, My Voice, um, which was just a space that anyone could um, share their story of what they had been through anonymously or not anonymously. Um, and so I started this and very shortly after, um, an opportunity uh, came up because the um, officer of the women's department at the university that I go to, she knew someone else who also wanted to do something similar to me. And so she put us in contact. Um, and so I met Joey, who um, also wanted to engage the community in discussions on um, the normalization of attitudes and behaviors which lead to sexual violence. And so we basically brainstormed what we wanted to do and we created uh, the organization Young Women Against Sexual Violence. Um, so what we do is have events um, every six weeks or so at different venues in the city, um, which are basically creative events like storytelling or art exhibitions or music nights just to engage the community in this discussion. Um, and it was amazing. We had our first event, 70 people came to it. Um, and then recently we had just last week actually an event called A Letter to My Perpetrator, which was really um, special to me because it was something that I've wanted to do for two years, just come to life. And when me and Joey started Young Women Against Sexual Violence, um, we said to each other that our goal is to have 50% men attending because it's so important that men be a part of this conversation and reflect on the role that they play in this, um, considering it is predominantly men who um, are, perpetrating sexual assault. Um, and this was our second event last week, a letter to my perpetrator, and we had over 50% men um, came to the event. Had 50 people actually at the event and amazing. Activism, you know, so often people want to do something, people care about an issue but we don't know what we can do. Um, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Am I still, can I, you hear me? You're okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So often, you know, people will care about an issue, but we won't know what to do. And for so long, I felt disempowered. I felt like all I wanted was for my voice to be heard. All I wanted is for no woman to ever be touched again or girl to be touched when we don't want to be touched. And I want society to, like wake up 
to the issue and, and acknowledge we have an issue and we need to reflect on ourselves and why is this happening? And, um, and it was really difficult for such a long time to feel empowered and to feel that I can actually do something. But as soon as I met one other person who also wanted to do something, all of a sudden, like we just made it happen. Um, and I think, yeah, I think some things that I've learned is that you can contact anyone that you want to contact. Um, you can do anything that you want to do, but um, so often, you know, I don't think society makes people realize our own agency and, um, and I feel really, really just lucky and grateful that my life brought me to experience the experiences I experienced and then feel and realize my own agency and have the resources internal and external um, to be able to do what I want to do and also live in a time um, and place. Thank you for having me speak. Oh, Michaela, thank you so very, very much. And could everyone give again uh, our internet uh, Zoom clap. You know, it's quite inspiring. And in the chat, a number of people have talked about how they want to replicate the sort of events that you've done. And what you've said is right. When there are more than one person, when there are two of us, we can do all sorts of things that we, we would like to do, but we can't do on our own. And please, everyone, know that NCJWA We'll do things if you come and you come and work with us, we will try and make things happen. Michaela's now come and joined uh, after uh, I was fortunate enough to meet her. She's going to be working with the people in Perth and helping bring some other uh, people involved to do some uh, activism of various sorts in NCJWA. So thank you so much, Michaela, for sharing. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing because we all need to know that it's possible. We really need to be uh, hear stories like yours. They're quite inspiring. So someone else who's inspiring to us and someone we can never forget is the teacher. There are teachers who change us. So many people, when you ask the story of what is it that happened in your life that made a difference to you, will tell you that it was the teacher who said the right thing at the right time. So for our fifth candle tonight, we're going to move on to Peter jones Pellach. Peter is uh, not only an important person, she's also my sister, which is very important because one of the people who was very influential in my life was my big sister, who was one of my teachers. Peter uh, is a teacher and an activist in Jerusalem. She's, uh, amongst other things, a senior fellow at the Kivestein Institute, which is a feminist organization in Jerusalem. She's the director of education at the Elijah Interfaith Institute. And she's the co-founder of Praying Together in Jerusalem. Uh, she's a blogger about uh, Israel and she speaks on SBS radio every Sunday so that she should keep a lookout for her. She's had the, uh, the good fortune to have studied with Nechama Leibovitz, who was a particularly profound uh, intellect and a woman who contributed to so many people in the way they related to their Judaism. So Peter's going to talk to us about the role that a teacher can have. And of course, all our role models are teachers, but real teachers also need to be acknowledged and celebrated. So Peter, over to you. So I'm going to share my screen um, because one of the things is, as a teacher, I'm, I'm fed up with seeing my face on the screen. I know many teachers uh, resonate with that. Um, and also because I want to give the center stage to my teacher, Nachama Leibovitz. And I should start by saying to you that um, it was 1997, it was a Friday night. And on that Friday night, I was about to light the Shabbat candles and the phone rang. And I said to my son, who was about five at the time, I said, please don't pick up the phone. Um, but of course it was, no, it was actually, it was 1997, he was nearly 10, but I said, don't pick up the phone. I had the candle in my, the match in my hand, but he picked it up, it was too late. So I took the call and it was a student, an adult student I'd had years before, hadn't had any contact with him in between. And he um, was on the phone because he just picked up the Jewish news and he saw that Nahama Leibovitz had passed away and he knew I would be mourning her. And it wasn't till that moment that I realized how often I had deferred to Nahama in my teaching. Um, he brought it home to me and 
of course, Nahama had a huge impact on my life, meeting such a person. Um, I'm going to come to this in a second, but I just remember when somebody told me that I would have a new opportunity to learn from Nahama Leibovitz, I just really didn't even believe it. Nahama Leibovitz, I could learn from her. And not only that, I could learn from her twice a week in her home. The first opportunity of that first time a week was with a small group. We were about 15 people. For two years, that small group of us met with Nahama in her home. She was already elderly by that time, but nothing had um, weakened or, or lessened her intellect. And when I think of links between Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Nahama Leibovitz, one of the strongest links is here were women with incredible sharpness, incredible intellect, and putting that intellectual ability to great use. Um, here we have a picture of her, as I remember her, with the beret. Note, I also <laughs> wear a beret in winter. Nahama wore it summer and winter. And I remember once when she was, um, while we were learning with her, they wrote a newspaper article about her. And the newspaper article opened with, in her traditional brown beret. And she threw it down. She said, how stupid. Why are they commenting on what I look like? <laughs> and so that was Nahama. Um, she had a profound influence on people and she continued to teach right up until the year she passed away into her 90s. It's something really incredible. Um, when she received uh, the Israel Prize for Education, um, she was already a phenomenon. And this is really something because most people aren't such a phenomenon in their lifetime. She was, her book was already a classic. And um, what they used to say about Nahama Leibovitz was she was the only woman in Israel who went inside every yeshiva. What does, what does it mean by that? In the yeshiva, in traditional yeshiva study, men, men went straight to Talmud and hardly studied Torah. And of course, in order to understand the Talmud, you have to study Torah. But they weren't teaching it. And the Chama Leibovitz's books became the classics for the men in yeshiva, but they with the, we used to talk that they had books. The Chama was under the table because it was almost like a guilty admission that you still had to return to Torah studies because the Chama changed that. Nowadays, in any serious yeshiva, they make sure that the men and women, because now there are as many women as men studying in, in yeshiva, types of, of systems they might not always call them the yeshiva but that's that at that level of learning now there are as many women as men and Nahama changed it she changed it across the jewish world with the exception of only a tiny number of Haredi yeshivot men now learn torah it was her influence imagine this thought that there is a woman who has changed the course of jewish education at the highest levels and not only jewish education Harvard University's um, Department of Biblical Studies acknowledge that Nahama Leibovitz changed their approach to Torah study as well, taking the text far more seriously in and of its own right. I've included the cover of the book and I've included my first page, which has a signature. But you have to know that when Nahama signed something, she didn't do any of these, you know, to my beloved student or any of that. She thought it was actually a bit of nonsense. I had to sort of force her to sign my book so that this would be something I'd carry with me. Um, I'll show you in a moment what she really cared about. So I've already explained that learning with this great woman was an incredible privilege. Um, by the time I learned with Nahama, she was in her 80s and she was not anywhere near retired, but you did have to be sensitive to going to her home. So um, we used to, uh, once, as I said, once a week, it was a small group. It was during the day, it was, it was different. But to go to the public events, what was a public event? Public event was once a week, Nahama taught the weekly Torah reading to the first 30 or so people that could arrive. You arrived at her home very sensitive to the fact that she needed to rest first, but you knew if you didn't get there in time and there wasn't a place around the table, you didn't get in. There was no preference. Anybody could go. At the table were high court judges, members of the Knesset, rabbis, backpackers, 
teachers, shopkeepers, taxi drivers, anybody who wanted to come. The idea was to arrive and to sit at the table, but there was also a condition. You had to arrive in order to participate. And Nahama, as a teacher par excellence, made sure that everybody participated. I need to do one description of her table only. I wish I had time for, for more, but I do, I've put, put on my note there, Rav Ariel Levine. Nahama's, um, I, when I used to teach not on Zoom, I used to be able to compare the size of her table to something physical in the room. So as we're not in a physical room, I just like you to imagine a very, very large uh, dining room table or a director's table. And you'd have a total of up to three um, rows around the table and that was it. On her table and a place, there were very few um, ornaments. Everything was books and papers, but there was one picture on her table. And that was the picture of Rav Arie Levine. Some of you may have heard of him. Rav Arie Levine was known as the Tzaddik of Jerusalem. During the time of the British mandate, he used to visit the prisoners held by the, by the British. And he was known for his modesty. How did she have his photo? The story is told that somebody wanted to write a newspaper article about his good work with the prisoners. And they went to interview him and they brought a photographer with them to interview Rav Arie Levine. When he saw the photographer, he said, no, 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 I don't want my picture taken, like Nakama, this is nonsense. But the journalist wisely said to him, but Rav Arie Levine, if you don't let him take your photo, this journalist won't make a living today. So he agreed to have his photo taken so that the photographer could, could get a few pennies. Um, and it was that photograph, was the photograph that Nahama kept on her table. Um, I've already mentioned that the participants in the class were everyone, but I need to mention my husband. On that open night, my husband would come with me to that lesson, also being in awe of this incredible teacher. And Aaron had two special jobs. The first one was the minute we walked in the room, she would give him her earring, hearing aids and say, um, Aaron, please fix these, they're squeaking again. Every single lesson. But the most important thing that Aaron had to do was to um, go up Every time somebody asked a question, and Nahama wanted to refer to one of her worksheets. On the right-hand side is one of these worksheets. Nahama was famous for these worksheets, which she produced from 1942 to 1971. They came about because she was teaching in 1942 in a girls' school on a kibbutz. And so now these were girls who came as unaccompanied girls, most of them, not all of them, unaccompanied girls during the war, escaped Europe, were looked after on a kibbutz, and they were together in a like a boarding school. And she would teach there during the during the school year. But in the summer, when it came to the summer break, they said, Nahama, what are we going to do? We want to learn from you still. And she said, I can't, I would love to. But during the summer, I have to teach a summer school course at Bar Ilan University. So I can't teach you. So I said, what are we going to do? She said, I'll tell you what, I'll prepare these worksheets on the weekly Torah reading, on the weekly parasha, and you can do them. And I'll send you, I'll post them to you. You post them back to me, I'll mark them. This process was that so successful that the boys at the adjoining boys school said, it's not fair that you've got worksheets to do from Nakama during the summer, we want them too. So the boys school started, I'm, I'm racing through this to explain to you, this became a phenomenon. She started sending worksheets all over the world. Look how many years she did it for 30 years. That means there are 30 different sheets on each parasha and each weekly reading. And she was saying everywhere, one story that I must share with you that was known about them is that during the War of Independence, she was sending them also to soldiers. And there was a soldier who kept um, through 1948-49, he, um, his mailing address was a convalescent hospital. And when Nahama saw that for several weeks in a row, she got the, the return sheets from a convalescent hospital, she wrote back to him and said, I'm so sorry that you are still in the hospital. And then it turned out that he was uh, in the army on a, in a secret place and he was using the convalescent hospital as his mailing address only. But why I tell this story is because Nahama noticed she was now writing to thousands of people every week marking each sheet and she noticed 
And this was typical of Nahama that she noticed. If you dared in her class, whisper something to somebody, remember she has hearing aids, she's a woman in her, in her 80s, she would notice and say, what are you saying? What's, she never missed anything. And that's why I think of her sharpness. So I was telling you about these Gilly or not, these worksheets and Aaron's job. Somebody would ask a question on the worksheet that we might be working on at that time. And she would say, Aaron, up there, no, just to the right, just, just a little bit further. Yes, down one, exactly that one. She knew where every one of these worksheets was on her shelves, and she would instruct her on which one to bring down to answer a particular question. Now, you'll notice on the left-hand side, it's my handwriting. What happened with Nahama's lesson was she'd ask a question, and she would give everybody the opportunity to write the answer that she wanted. The question was usually a deep thinking question, comparing two ideas, finding the difference between two ideas or finding the link between different ideas, finding, uh, understanding why one commentator had taken one direction and another commentator had taken another, a real question. And she would give us time to write our answer and hand our answer to her and she would mark it usually by a red line through it and pass it back. And remember, she's dealing with rabbis and as I said, high court judges, whoever it might be, everybody's treated exactly the same. You handed her the worksheet, she'd put her red line through, try again and hand it back. Nahama taught me the importance of time and silence in a classroom. As a teacher prior to going to Nahama, my instinct was the child that put up their hand first had the quickest answer, I thought that was good and would encourage it. And the Hama said exactly the opposite. True learning takes time. Think about it. Get it wrong a few times before you get it right. That was one of the huge influences she had on me. And I think that's a message for all of us as women. If I had time, I'd tell you many, many more stories. Um, Nahama wanted us to love what we were doing. Her method when she was asked to describe it, she says, I have no method. I only teach the commentaries, nothing is my own. But what she wanted us to do, of course, she had a method. Of course, it was hers. But what she wanted us to do was feel the ownership of the biblical text. And she said that the most important thing is that students should study the Torah from all angles, search it out, choose or reject interpretations all providing that they engage in Torah out of love. She encouraged everybody to read the text. Now, Nahama herself would only teach in Hebrew. I break her rules by teaching in English, but my principle is the same. Everybody can read the text. Everybody can own the text. Everybody can learn from the text. Of course, our interpretation is not going to be as good as the great commentators that she showed us because they knew the whole text, but at least we should feel that sense of ownership. She had some incredible educational principles. For time's sake, I'm not going to read through them all. I'm just going to tell you that the first one is the most important, that learning is an active process, that the activity of the teacher is not an indicator of the active learning of the student. And the last things I want to point out at number nine is that she believed that the divine text was divine, the text is sacred, but every interpretation is human. And therefore, every interpretation can be criticized. And the most important thing is that we should be all empowered to have our own love and learning of the text. Um, she also made incredible contribution to biblical scholarship and paved the way for women to be biblical scholars. There are generations now of women who are biblical scholars because Nahama paved the way. Many of them were actually her students, as you can imagine, teaching for all those years. She taught almost all the um, current um, uh, generations of biblical uh, of women biblical scholars and many of the men as well. And um, even those who didn't directly learn from her had her as the model, the breakthrough, who and saying. It's okay for women. In fact, her motto was, why not? And like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, areas that were thought of as for men only, but why? Why for men only? Why not for women? Women have the intellect. 
have the power, have the abilities, why not rather than why? And women do have a different approach to tourist study. They enrich it. And there are four ways that I've put here. The first one is that, that women, because they were excluded for so many generations, tend to come with new methods. Women are more likely to, to look at the characters of the text with a lens, a, what you might call a psychological lens, to look at the, the characters as more human. Uh, the fact that women in the orthodox world were often better educated secularly than their main counterpoints, counterparts meant that they brought this literary uh, knowledge and wisdom onto the study of the text. And finally, women were free from the constraints that anything they were going to take was going to, was going to say might have legal implications in the halakhic world, which by the way is no longer true, but it was true when Nahama was teaching. Now there are many women halakhists, legal interpreters, freed up because of part of the process that Nahama brought to us. Um, the tributes to her um, erudition has existed before and since, but the a panoply of pedagogical devices which she invented or refined was uniquely and characteristically hers. Absolutely, there's there's not been another Torah scholar like Nahama. There probably wasn't even one in all the generations of Torah scholarship. Nahama stands there, holds her own ground. And as a teacher, she broke through to share it in I think a uniquely female way that she wanted, she didn't see that being a teacher was beneath her. Being a teacher was the greatest thing she could possibly be. Um, Saul Lieberman said, there's no one in our generation, no man or woman who has contributed so much to Jewish education. And that was indeed the case. What a privilege it was for me to learn from her. And I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into what it was like to be in the Hamas presence. Well, Peter, thank you very, very much. This has been so inspiring. Our fifth candle for the teachers amongst us. And one of the things that was important is that we can learn and we can all own the text. And we can, one of the things that's music to my ears as a lawyer and when I taught administrative and constitutional law, the struggle was always to get students to read the legislation, read the text, the same problem that you have, because we need to know what we're dealing with and to understand it, as you say, and to own it. And it's when we have that ownership that we can move on and feel confident and more comfortable about uh, moving. The sort of way I think Michaela described that she began to own something from the lessons she'd learned in life and to have a wonderful teacher, uh, as so many of us have been fortunate to have, but, you know, uh, very few people have had the honor of learning, or comparatively very few people had the honor of learning from Nechama Leibovitz, and I've certainly learned from her books. And uh, I think it is so important that we acknowledge with our fifth candle how important the teachers are to all of us. Our sixth candle tonight is uh, going to be from somebody who is learning and taking the idea of being a student very, very seriously. Uh, it's our own Naomi Kultman. Uh, uh, sorry, I've just, I've just, now I've just called somebody by the wrong name, Nomi, I'm sorry. And Nomi is a student at the, Maha, at the Maharat Yeshiva. She is studying in the four year Smicha program. She's also got a Bachelor of Laws, a Bachelor of Liberal Arts in Politics and Jewish Civilization. She's got a master's degree in, in uh, legal practice. She's worked uh, in so many different areas in parliament and she's worked uh, as part of uh, with the Shadow Attorney uh, General of Australia as advisor to the Minister for Small Business in the Victorian Legislative Assembly. So, so many ways for somebody who is really not somebody who's in their 60s, as you'd expect when you read her CV, but somebody who's still got many, uh, many, many years of contribution to make. And Nomi is going to talk about celebrating the Shekhinah and Judaism's call for social action. Nomi, over to you for our sixth candle. Thanks, Melinda. Um, I'm going to speak about celebrating the Shekhinah and Judaism's call for social action. So the word Shekhinah is derived from shochen, to dwell within. And the Shekhinah is God, as God is dwelling within each of us. Sometimes we translate Shekhinah as the divine presence. The word Shekhinah in Hebrew is feminine. So when we refer to God as Shekhinah, we say she, 
Of course, we're still referring to one God, just in a different modality. After, after all, you were probably wondering why most people insist on calling God he. We're not talking about being limited by any form, certainly not a body that could be identified as male or female. You may have heard of the Kabbalistic creation narrative first told by Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, known as the Ari. The narrative is told in dazzling, spectacular me metaphor. It goes like this. Prior to the creation of our chain of worlds, another order was created. That order was called Tohu. Tohu was the first example of planned uselessness. It was designed to fail. It's the source of every type of passion and desire that has the potential to destroy everything in its wake, including itself. It was designed with absolute intensity so that the energy it contained would be in complete conflict with the vessels its energy entered. And so Tohu brought about its own destruction, but it was for a purpose. From that initial catastrophe, the highest sparks fell to the lowest places. Think of an explosion. Those elements upon which the greatest force is exerted will fly the furthest from the core of the explosion, which tells us that to find the most powerful remnants of the essence, the light of Tohu, we need to journey to the lowest of the worlds that, explo that that explosion generated. So where is the lowest of these worlds? Well, we're in it. This is a world of total otherness a world where there dwell creatures that have no sense of anything else other than this world we live in. Sometimes, even these creatures sense that they themselves are masters of this world or that nothing else exists other than, than, than themselves. It's a material world. Things couldn't get more discreetly tangible, more self-absorbed, more otherly than they are down here, which is why the Shekhinah descends into the world, to seek out those most precious sparks, to rescue them from their shells of darkness, to reconnect them to their source above so they once again become meaningful and divine. All through us, the Shekhinah's agents, so that this world and this life of ours plays out not, not just as not another zero-sum game, but as an investment with incomparable returns. Understanding the paradox of our journey in exile will help us fathom the depth of this secret of the Shekhinah. Perhaps it will even hint to some notion of its resolution. If you've ever set up to clean a very dirty room, you, could probably, you can probably relate to the following. Daunted by the task ahead of you, you cleverly start with the big stuff. Having dislodged some of the furniture, moving it into appropriate corners, tossed a few cardboard boxes into recycling, and discovering, yes, there is a floor down there. Only then can you really get started. But that's also when it becomes apparent just how ugly the mess really is. Now it's a time for scraping, grinding, elbow grease and harsh chemicals. The hardest tasks are always left for last. And so too with our messy world. As soon as the initial sparks are redeemed, yet more challenging missions arise. As time progresses, the divine sparks become harder to discover, locked within the darkest realms, stubbornly refusing to be extricated from there. The darkness itself fights back, lashing out at any soul that comes to take away the captives. The greater the spark, the more intense the battle. A head-on attack by only failure and return. Failure is one of those things that cannot be prearranged. It is only through failure that you can redeem not only the most intense sparks of Tohu, but the darkness itself. The darkness caused you to fail. And now when you return to it, it's the experience of darkness that drives you with unstoppable drive. You have become what the Zohar calls a master of return who is drawn to God with great power than the one who has never failed. And what is the Jewish response to this type of brokenness in our society? There's so much wisdom in Jewish tradition about how every human being has inherent human dignity and worth and how we should treat each other the way we treat ourselves and about our ability as humans to make a difference in the world. The Torah mentions the obligation to love the stranger no less than 36 times. Many more times it mentions the obligation to keep kosher or observe Shabbat. Our tradition teaches us in Mishnah Sanhedrin that anyone who destroys a single life is considered to have destroyed a world. And yet, anyone who saves a life is considered to have saved an entire world. The field of Jewish social justice is a response to the brokenness of our world and a way to bring deep Jewish wisdom to that work. For our Jewish community to fully live our justice values, we can't hold ourselves at arm's length from those who are in need now. Our work for justice must flow from being in a relationship with people who are vulnerable, from listening to the stories that they share and from standing up to their needs. So taking inspiration from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
how do we nurture impassioned Jewish change makers and foster, foster this type of Jewish expression? Here are some of the key concepts as we embark and embed in all our work. One, being proximate to suffering is fundamental. We have to understand why people are suffering in our society in order to create change. When we get close, we hear things that can't be heard from afar. We see things that can't be unseen. And sometimes that makes a difference between acting justly and unjustly. Two, we all have the ability to make a difference to the world. Every deed counts, every word has power, and we can do each our share to redeem the world despite all absurdities and frustrations and disappointment. Three, being rooted in community makes a vital difference. Social change is inspired and sustained when people are part of a community of moral courage and spiritual strength. And lastly, four, we need to aim for solutions rather than bandages. Exploring the systematic causes of poverty and injustice in our communities and country can help us to create viable solutions. When we ask deep questions about how to create permanent solutions, the most pressing issues, including poverty, hunger, immigration, and analyze how these challenges manifest themselves across cities, communities, and institutions, we are halfway there to creating the solution. So as we celebrate Hanukkah, we are guided by the power of the Shekhinah and the influence and memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the call for social justice. We recognize our power to grow, the power to light up the darkness and spread the light. Chag Sameach. I'm grinning from ear to ear. Can everybody share a Zoom clap with Nomi? It's so amazing that people can approach this subject in so many different ways and so many different angles and see so much importance and light in the different sorts of ways we have our inspiration and the different sorts of things that will make us act the way we have to act. I love, Nomi, the idea that we need to be proximate to suffering. You know, my mother, uh, who, of course, influenced me like so many people's mothers do, do my, my mother would say uh, in her very... Christian way in a way, the, the sort of thing, message that she got at school, that, you know, that came from Shakespeare or from the hymns, it was always there, but for the grace of God go I. And it's such an important principle, you know, that I am so lucky. I'm lucky that I'm in Australia and I'm lucky that I'm, uh, you know, in, in a financially okay position. I'm lucky that I have access to food, that I have a home, that I'm not, uh, you know, living with the scourge of anti-Semitism that is unmanageable. We have anti-Semitism, of course, but we are able to deal with it. I'm able to have access to Jewish learning, to have teachers. I'm have able to learn from all of you, to meet all you incredible people, to have access to this technology. And the uh, what's inside us, the Shekhinah, the spark that we can capture is just so important. And on Hanukkah, what better time to talk about light than tonight? So Nomi, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. So although I've got six speakers on the, on the program, we've actually got a seventh person who's coming tonight to be our seventh candle, but she's going to be not just our seventh candle, but light our candles for us, because now in Melbourne, it's nice and dark and ready to light the candles. So Gabby Davis is not only our Zoom master tonight, she's the, as I've mentioned, I think before, she's the newest employee for National Council of Jewish Women Australia, coming on board only a couple of weeks ago. And she's in her current role, about to finish her role at the Australian Union of Jewish Students. So she's a fresh activist, keen to bring the world uh, and help us all work together to change the world, not just for the next 10 years or 20 years, but for the next 50 years or 100 years. So we're very, very, very fortunate that Gabby's joined us and uh, with so much thought, so much interest in Jewish communal politics and with such fresh wisdom. And Gabby, I'm going to hand over to you to light candles for us. Thank you so much, Gabby. Great. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you have your Hanukkiyot ready, feel free to lie with me, um, but otherwise I'm happy to do this on behalf of everyone. Okay. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kitshanu v'bitzotah v'tivanu, lehad l'ikneshe Hanukkah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, sh'asa nisim l'avotzeinu, b'yamim b'ayem b'zman hazeh. Lighting candles. Okay. 
הנרות הללו אנחנו מדליקים, הנרות הללו אנחנו מדליקים, על הניסים ועל הנפלאות ועל התשואות ועל המלחמות שעשית על אבותינו, שעשית על אבותינו בימים ההם, בימים ההם, בימים ההם, בזמן הזה. מה עוד זו ישועתי, וכמה אל אשבח. תיקון בית תפילתי, ושם תודה נדבח. לעת הכין מטבח, ניצם המבח. אז אגמו בשם מזמור. חנוכת המזבח, אז אגמור בשם מזמור, חנוכת המזבח. חג שמח, everyone. Thank you, Gabby, so, so much. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's been very wonderful. Thank you incredibly to all of our speakers and Gabby for that beautiful, beautiful and moving lighting of the candles. And I think... I'd like to say to all of you, please stay in contact. Please keep an eye out for the different things we're doing. The first thing that's happening in the new year is we're going to have some advocacy training for people to engage in the advocacy around the Uluru Statement of the Heart. So keep an eye out for that and many, many other activities. Hag Sameach, Hanukkah Sameach. Almost now it's Wednesday, so we can say Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all very, very much for being with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for speaking and thank you for participating. Good night. <laughs>